This season, turn it up to 10. Sort of like a bad habit, we gon' do it again. Ready or not, we're gonna tie up some ends. Go tell a 36, try to grab all the friends. We are back like we never left. On track like a treble clef. Skip a beat on the seventh rest. Bring feast, we don't pass them over. We got the first fruits, no way to show us. Can't live on that bread alone. Every word of God's mouth will fuel me on. That's scripture, that's Christ alone. That's grace alone, that's faith alone. All glory to God, cause that's his alone. Since the land's been slain, we can each belong. The Lord is my strength, my peace, and my song. Get our it all down at the feet of his throne. This yoke is easy, this burn is light. Even with a loud mouth trying to eat at the mic. Even if we down south, the humidity spike. Bales torn in two so we could be all right. It's all grace till the half goes off. Heretics better run till the top blows off. Got them all stood still like a jaw full of Botox. Time to bring them down like a jaw on a blow pop. Don't stop, they're in need of it though. Through grace, by faith, they could easily grow. New wave, new age, new way to see bro. Now one truth, life, one way to his throne. Son, it's the year of the feast, we gon' grow some Time to put some meat in the bones Gotta put the milk down, son, it's time to leave home I'm just saying there's a time in the season You gotta be a Berean If you just hear and believe it, you could be walking with demons It could be rendering season All the things that go to God, that's a little like treason Wait, welcome back, my friends Did you ever really think we could pass the 10? Our stock's up, we about to trend Cause the whole 36 wanna rap again Wait, sounds like good to be true Like we're bending candy land, ain't no ladders, just shoot We hold true, if it's loaded in the cannon Best believe it's understanding, if it's not, it ain't proof like sacred name of the two house frame E is the tickle then you fill it in the blanks You better not, you be better off Not trying to hassle half, you can take it to the bank This night ready, he's about to go off Put the ring on your finger from the cracker jack box It's hide and seek, let's see if you can find out All the little messages you hear before the time out Ever seen a scholar with a blue belt I have, he's about to make your food melt The loud one and he strikes again But don't let him close range, he gon' bite your friends So relax, gotta still in control He knows every care, every village you hold He knows every hair, every need for your soul Nothing new around here, this story's been told I bet you feel weak and your life is in tatters With bruised feet, your body is battered You can't reach, trying to climb up that ladder Sit back and hold fast to Messiah Matters These guys are better. It is Wednesday, April 10th to 2024. This is Messiah Matters number 468. My coffee's already getting cold, but we're just warming up. My name is Caleb Hegg. <laughs> he knows every hair, every need of your soul. I oh, love yeah. that line, man. I hear that. I love it. I'm Rob Banoff, loving that line. Yeah. Yes, you are. <laughs> what is up? It's going I'm never going to get good at that, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Maybe someday it's we'll okay. switch it. You know, I used to do the intro for both of us. Maybe we should, <laughs> maybe we should just move back. Season twelve. <laughs> it's, it's we're we're gonna revert back. Uh, okay. It's like deer in the headlights. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I you know I wrote my little uh, my little whatever about thirty seconds before I said it while we were listening to the music. So you know that's how it goes. Okay, uh, yeah, we got uh, an interesting one for us today, and uh, excited, excited. Uh, we got some good ones. We're kind of, uh, this is kind of like a, uh, a mailbag grab. We used to have a mailbag song. I don't know, I don't know if, 
I don't know if the 36 remember. We used to have a mailbag song. I think it got flagged for copyright infringement at one point. Anyway, oh, not the it? point. Was it? Yeah. The... No, no. It You've was got... mail time, mail time, mail time. The mail is here. You've got mail. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, so we're going into the mailbag. I went into the uh, I went into the the MM email folder. It's where I throw everything that I you know it'll come in during the week, and if I don't have time to look at it, I'll just kind of throw it into the folder. So. Every once in a while, I'll go back in there, and today, that's where we're going. First, let's talk about this. See Heg at TorahResource.com. It's C-H-E-G-G at TorahResource.com. You can also leave us a voicemail, 253-465-3205. It's 253-465-3205. Find old shows at Messiah Matters, along with merch. I know we're slacking, and I know my uh, our spring producers are waiting for a producer credit. Don't worry. It's coming. Uh, I talked to Mike just the other day, and uh, we got ideas. We got things going up here, okay? So we should have cups out and uh, producer credits. I know some of our producers have already paid, and uh, we got everybody's name still up there, so don't worry. We will get new producer credits, and when we do, then uh, if you want to be in the spring producer, then uh, you can do so. This show is brought to you by TorahResource.com. Go to Torah Resource. Man, we got some really cool stuff going on right now, and the, the, the work, it's like Mount Everest rising before us. It's just like constantly... It's, uh, there's just so much work to do. It's, it's ridiculous. I know our tour resource right now, we got the site is kind of broken in certain places. You'll notice that all of our footnotes are off. That's okay. Uh, we're, we're working on it. We're going to get that all settled probably in the next week or two. Just yet another job that has to get done, but we got some really cool things in the wings and, uh, hopefully in the next uh, couple of weeks within the, but hopefully by the end of April, we should have, uh, so right around the time Passover is, is uh, wrapping up, we should probably have some courses, some evergreen courses. We've been working on this for a long time. Um, it's, it's coming together now. We got some evergreen courses. You know, once you sign up for them, um, then you will have, you'll be, he'll have access to it in perpetuity. And uh, that's not like our courses have been before. Now, of course, since they're evergreen, you're not going to have, um, like live classes or a teacher, but all the information's there. We've worked it out so that there's a lot of stuff that you can do. There's uh, tests that you can take and exams to make sure that you're retaining the knowledge. It's good, man. It, it is. It's really good. And, uh, it's a, a, a model that I thought that we should have done a long time ago. <clears throat> and I'm happy that we're finally moving that way. Okay, finally, last but not least, do not forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. I know it sounds weird. It actually does help us. And um, if you're already subscribed, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up. Okay, let's jump in. Anything you want to say? I mean, you've been, I've just been talking. You want to you want to say anything to the lovely people out there before we jump in? Hi, all. I love you all. Shalom. <laughs> Fair. That's let's, good. Let's get let's, this party started. Let's do it. Okay. Well, let's just go here. <laughs> um, Courtney wrote in this. I, and by the way, uh, apologies to everybody who wrote these emails. I don't know. How old they are. Some of them are probably pretty old. Some of them might be brand new. I don't know. But Courtney wrote in. I think it's Courtney. I, I know the last name. I wasn't sure on the first name, but I think it's Courtney. Courtney wrote in. She said, I had a friend ask me about eating fat. She is in a Torah group on Facebook, and there's some arguments about whether or not you are permitted to eat fat on animals. For example, beef uh, tallow or fat on certain cuts. They are using Leviticus 7, 22 through 25. Let's go ahead and move over there. I have my other passages Okay, here we go. So 20 through 25 of Leviticus 7, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, you shall eat no fat of ox or sheep or goat, the fat of an animal that dies of itself. Now this is important, by the way, take note here, the fat of an animal that dies uh, of itself and the fat of one that is torn by beasts may be put to any other use, but on no account shall you eat it. For every person who eats of the fat of an animal of which a food offering may be made uh, to the Lord shall be cut off from his people. Okay, so I am just going to, this is a quick one in my book, but I will throw it over to you in just a second. I'm going to give you my interpretation here. Um, as we know, and as we talk about a lot on this show, um, uh, scripture interprets, interprets scripture. And a perfect example of this, uh, the idea of scripture interpreting scripture is the whole, uh, wearing cloth of woven fabrics, right? We are told in Leviticus, you can't wear a cloth that is, that has, uh, two fabrics put together on it. 
But then uh, we get a better picture and understanding of what it's talking about in Deuteronomy when it specifies the command and tells us that it's actually just wool and linen. You can't mix wool and linen. So one commandment is broad, and it gives us the general sense of what's going to happen, and then the other command interprets that command and tells us exactly what is going on there, wool and linen. And this is the exact same way. We have the, uh, the command that we're not allowed to eat fat, according to this passage. Now, if we go back to Leviticus 3, 3, and we look at the offerings, right? Remember that I said that the offerings, or that the that, that part was important. It's important because th this is the interpretation. It tells us in Leviticus 3, 3 and 4, he says, and from the sacrifice of a peace offering as a food offering to the Lord, he shall offer the fat covering the entrails, all the fat that is on the entrails, and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins, and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. The fat that is being spoken of is, in fact, a very specific fat, because it is the fat that you have to offer to the Lord. You're not allowed to eat it if it's in an offering. And our text in the uh, Leviticus, what was it, Leviticus uh, 7 passage, tells us that you're allowed to use it if it's torn in the in the field. Why is that? Because if it's torn in the field, you're not allowed to offer it. You can't offer it as a offering to the Lord. However, you can still use the point is is that in that instance, you can use that fat for something else. You still can't eat it. If you were just going to say that you can't eat any fat at all, then you wouldn't be able to eat any beef. For instance, I eat uh I eat ground beef quite a bit. What does it say? Usually it's 80/20. 80% lean, 20% fat. Or um, I actually eat 93.8 or 93.7 rather, which is 93% lean, 7% fat. Doesn't taste as good, but whatever. So the point is, is that you're talking about you're talking about a very specific fat, and the fat is specified within the Torah itself. Rob. Yeah, I just take that that verse that you mentioned, chapter three, where it clarifies, and then it just every time it's mentioning it, it's referring back to to that. It's, it's talking about the fat that covers the different organs and everything. It's, it's not talking about like, you know, like you have a steak or whatever. I mean, there's no way, like you think about the peace offerings, that's where Israelites bring an animal, one of the, one of the acceptable animals and they have a barbecue. I mean, so they're eating the meat um, and um, there's, they're not like trying to cut every little piece of what we call fat in English in meat out. It's, it's a, it's a translation issue and a concept issue. So I want to address the chat room real quick. Hello, chat room. It's uh, good that everyone's here. And mm -hmm. we have a new listener in our, uh, chat room. G Atlas says just subbed. Hello. Hello, G Atlas. And uh, I don't know if G Atlas is a man or a woman, but we're going to pretend for a few seconds that it's a man. Do hosts answer listeners' questions? Um, yeah, depends. You got to stay on topic. Now, uh, this is a perfect example. Last Was it last week we kicked the guy out and blocked him from the channel uh, because he was, oh, he uh, was... He was one of Toby Singer's uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, like disciples. Yeah, but the, the point is you gotta um, you have to stay on topic. I don't care. We don't care at all if uh, no, but we he, don't. That he came in just like spewing. Yeah, we don't care if you there. disagree with us. You're, if people are certainly allowed to disagree with us. We won't block people or put people in timeout for disagreeing with us or even having lively conversation uh, against us. That's fine. Uh, we instantaneously block for uh, foul language and we uh, anti missionary. Anti-missionary, we, we put people in timeout if you can't stay on topic, and uh, then if you get uh, if you get two warnings of not staying on topic, you get kicked out, um, and we don't like to do that, so let's not let's not do that. But yes, the answer, uh, uh, G. Alice, and Atlas says this. He says, "I found this channel by following links associated with a review Rob did reviewing Al Garza's Hebrew Gospel of John." Very cool. Well, I'm glad you found us. Um, yeah, and hello to everyone else in the chat room. All right. And that the the username Atlas that uh, I just bought a world Atlas. I'm very excited for. I've been reading this book. Can I just go completely off topic? Oh, Rob's fr frozen. Hang on. Can I go completely off topic for a second? I bought this book. It's called. Uh, it's not religious. It's like one of the first non-religious books I've seen in a really or a read in a really long time. It's by a guy named Tim Marshall, and it's called Prisoners of Geography. And I was looking for a good geography book and it's really political. It's like political 
geopolitics really is what it is. But man, is it interesting. He talks, he basically talks about why nations are formed the way they are by like, by their geography and why like wars can or cannot happen because of geography. It's super interesting. Anyway, sorry, that's a rabbit trail all because of G Atlas's uh, username. Okay, let's move on, shall we? Sorry for the froze for the freezing Rob for a few seconds. Let's move on. We're going to go to, <clears throat> that's right. See, the thing is that sometimes depending on the program, uh, see, he's frozen again. Uh, depending on what the program is, let me move him over here and I'm going to try to get to going to try to get to my show notes without freezing him. Okay. Anthony says this, I'm a newer Christian who has come to faith, uh, to come to, uh, to my faith and started to follow Torah. I do have a question concerning Leviticus 1927. I've seen, seen many instances of Torah teachers explaining this verse simply to mean to not cut your hair in the ways of the, of the pagans, which I believe to be the correct interpretation. But some say, based on the NIV version of the Bible, it means don't even trim these areas. If you can help give uh, help giving me some insight, I want to make sure I walk out Torah correctly. Okay, um, this is a fairly easy uh, verse. Actually, the very first thing I ever researched and uh, attempted to write on was this specific passage. And this was decades ago. Not really. This is, I don't know, 15 years ago or something like that. Um, and ultimately the conclusion that I came to, I never published that paper because, uh, I didn't think it was, it certainly wasn't good, <laughs> but my research is not mm -hmm. very good. However, what I, the conclusion I came to was that, uh, many pagan cultures actually cut their hair, uh, like they would cut their scalp in a way to make scars and those scars, uh, would make it so that the hair wouldn't grow. And so the, uh, command to not cut your hair, um, there's a specific word that could be interpreted plow. Um, to not plow the sides of your hair, head or your hair, I think actually means to cut yourself in, uh, in the way that the pagans did. I don't actually think it has to do with a haircut itself. However, I would say this: I think that the, you know, the Orthodox put a uh, a fence around this, right? They say you're you you're not allowed to shave your your head with a razor. Now, I don't think that there's necessarily anything wrong with shaving your head with a razor. However, we could talk about the idea of what happens if a person is shaving their head with a razor. And they cut themselves on accident with that razor. Now have they broken Torah? Now, obviously, we're getting into very what what mainstream Christianity would call the legalistic thing side of things. Of course, this is not a salvation issue, right? We're not talking about you know God sending down fiery hell upon us for accidentally cutting ourselves or anything like that. But simply just the the idea of a command. At what point is that command broken? Is does it come from the intention of the heart, as Yeshua says? Like if you even look at a a woman, you know, a married woman with lust in your heart, then you've committed adultery. So I mean, is that are, are we in that realm, or is it just the act of doing so? Because we see, like in the Torah itself, you have sacrifices for unintentional sins, and so the question would be, like, what happens if you accidentally cut yourself, and now have you transgressed transgressed that commandment not to plow the sides of your of your hair growth? I'm, Rob and I have not talked about this, by the way. He didn't know I was going here, so neither did I, to be completely honest. So, Rob, give me your <laughs> give me your wisdom. Well, I, I just I I'm to me the one that makes most sense to me the understanding. This has to do with ancient rites of mourning for the de for the dead. Um, we see the same passage, well, the same phraseology occur again in chapter 21 when it's talking about the high priest, how he cannot mourn for a family relative and, and says he, he can't, he can't uh, cut the edges of his beard in mourning. And then you see in Deuteronomy, you shall not cut yourself for the dead. So there's clusters of these. And in the prophets, we see this, I, this place where there's... Uh, a ritualistic uh, kind of aspect that has to do with maybe marking and it's, it's in the, it's clustered in with like tattoos, like somehow creating a, um, an, or expressing, you know, some sort of grief or mourning because of the dead. Um, that's, that's my take yep. on it. Absolutely. And I Agreed. think, yeah. And, and that, that does not, <laughs> exclude what you're saying too you know i people did crazy things you know um and yes. in our in our culture you know we're in a very high tatted culture in america at least um even you know even among evangelicals 
you know, men, you know, there's like a tattoo culture of who can have the best tattoos and stuff like that. So, which is strange because I don't think they're doing it for mourning of dead, but, but I, I, in my opinion, it's, um, it's, it's not a supported practice. In the I agree with you. The, uh, however, you know, there's been teachers before who have said, if you have a tattoo, you're lost. Like you, you can't come back. I certainly no, I don't believe that's that. Idiotic. Yeah. That's clearly idiotic. Okay. As, um, as it would be any, uh, yeah. Like that's the unforgivable sin is getting a tattoo. I, I don't think so. Yeah. And we've had people come to uh, congregations before that I've been a part of that have had past lives where that, you know, they're have face tattoos. They have tattoos of uh, horrific things that they are very ashamed of, you know, and what do you do at that point? Um, there are ways you can go. Okay. <clears throat> this is off topic, but I will allow it this one time. G Atlas asks a question to Rob concerning Al Garza. Now, actually, I, I mean, yeah. Do we even really want to get into Al Garza? Sure. Is it about the Hebrew his Hebrew Bible. Oh, or? man. Oh, Garza. Yeah. Uh, Garza is just all over the place, man. His his work is... is I mean, I bought his books because uh, I bought, bought a couple of his books when we were having back and forths because he said that we took him out of context. And when I bought his books, I realized it was way worse than I had initially thought. I mean, it was it was shocking how bad the, the, the work was. Um, he said, I had an, uh, a recent exchange with Al Garza, and he said, Paul retained his pharisaical view of free will, which makes the doctrines of grace an exegetical fallacy relative to understanding Paul's theology. Great. <laughs> I mean, okay. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I don't even know how to respond to that. That's an idiot. It's, it's an idiotic statement. The, not, here's not, the by, not by uh, Atlas. It's, right, right. It, it, it's the statement by Garza. I mean, we could we could go down so many avenues with it with such a statement. Is he suggesting that the new like the that the aspects of the new perspective on Paul that uh, are are incorrect? Even the Pharisee, I would argue, and I think that there is really good scholarship behind this. Jimmy Dunn, um, N.T. Wright, um, E.P. E. Sanders, of course. Right, and many, many, many others since then have put forward the notion that the that the Jews didn't believe you were in by uh, by keeping the Torah, and I would completely agree with that. You were already you were in. in by birth, and then yeah. you maintained your covenant. So the, the, no, the I mean that's the kind of I would argue that's what they that, call that's what Sanders called covenantal nomism. Right, and I would no, I, I would, don't. I don't I would argue, no. yeah, whether or not Sanders was right on that or not. The, the, I would argue this, though. I would argue that the idea that we have today, and don't get me wrong, I actually hold to the, doc, the doctrines of grace, okay? But ultimately, the idea of the doctrines of grace versus a free will model was not the concept that was going on in the first century among Judaisms, at least not, the, not from the evidence that, that we have. It was that you were, you were a covenant member by being Jewish. You were in. And that what I mean, and God has chosen you. So I mean, essentially, we could say it was a, a doctrines of grace view. God has chosen you according to your bloodline. In other words, He's the one who gave you the bloodline. He He ordained you to be born to the parents that you were born to, and therefore you are in covenant or out of covenant according to where God has placed you. Garza's uh, suggestion is, I'm sorry, like most of, like everything I've read from Garza. It uh, falls extremely flat. It's not. It it shows a lack of a lack of th good theology and a, a lack I, of research. My guess now again, after looking at that, well, I'm not interested at all in what Garza has to say. But my guess, yeah, he's here. probably looking at Josephus's description, where Josephus talks about Pharisees, Essenes, and Sadducees, and Pharisees and, and Josephus is trying to explain to his Gentile audience some of the nuance. Right. Um, and so the idea is, does, is everything fate? But see, he's using this concept of this idea of, I think it's Moira, I think in the, in Greek, the idea of, of like fate. I'd have to look up the Greek of that, but it's, it's not a Jewish concept. He's trying to, he's trying to use a, a Gentile concept of fate 
and explain the different Jewish phil and he's he's describing them as philosophies. So he's what there's no benefit for us today to think of Pharisees as philosophers, right? The reason the reason you would want to describe Sadducees, Pharisees, and Essenes as different kind of philosoph- uh, uh, philosophic schools is because you're trying to communicate to a people that those are really ingrained categories. And the, there's a, an issue of fate that the different oh. philosophical schools discuss. And he's just trying to say, hey, you know, if you're trying to understand about our people, we kind of have similar things. But to say, to insist then and smuggle in an idea of, quote, free will and say Paul retained his Pharisaic. <laughs> no, no. Next. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, like, so, yeah we're going to move on because that, uh, we're off topic now, which is uh, one of the reasons we normally don't address off topic conversation within the uh, chat room or even allow it, but we'll give a pass on this one. Okay, we're going to move on. This one is up my wheelhouse. Now, this is the one This is the one I really was excited for. Christian writes in, I was wondering if you and Rob could help me understand what Paul is teaching in 1 Corinthians 11, 26 through 34. Now, the reason that this is exciting for me is because for those of you who do not understand and don't know, um, I... I've done a lot of work in in meal customs, right? And uh, 1 Corinthians 11 has been kind of the, um, I don't know, it's it's been the elusive passage, right? What exactly is going on in 1 Corinthians 11? Now, I'm not going to pretend that I ha- have it all figured out. Um, however, what I can tell you is that he's certainly not talking about some ritual called the Lord's Supper. This And a- Andrew McGowan has done great work to show that this uh, title... The Lord's Supper was not attached to com- a communion or a Eucharistic service until the fourth century. And so um, clearly he has to be talking about something else, right? And so then the question obviously is, well, what is he talking about? Now, different scholars, even people like Andrew McGowan are going to still revert back to some early form of a Eucharistic service or some kind of a love meal offering or something like that. And he uses the word of ins- words of institution, which, is, uh, which can be found in Luke twenty two nineteen. 19. Do this in remembrance of me, okay? And he rewords it a little bit, but uh, same tradition, right? So uh, what exactly is going on here? Um, uh, he, what is going on here in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 11? Now, he, he, uh, Christian references 1 Corinthians 11, 26 through 34. So let's go there first, and we'll read it. 34, 33. Uh, no, I'm sorry. So he references 26 through 34. He says uh, in verse 27 is eating and drinking in an unworthy manner, speaking to unrepentant sin. I'm also unsure about what Paul is teaching on judging the body rightly. And I'm completely lost on 33 through 34. Any insights is greatly appreciated. Um, so first of all, let's just say this. Number one, I think that he's talking about communal meals. And one of the things that um, I'm 100% convinced on, and, I, and maybe we should let Rob go first on this and then I can c- come up behind. But one of the things I'm very 100% convinced on is that anytime a community came together as a meal, as a, for a date non, for a banquet meal in the first century, especially, especially if there's meat on the table, they saw it as a form of worship. Okay, and, and we have good evidence for this, canonical and non-canonical evidence for this, that uh, it was seen as a form of worship to whatever God, whether Christians were obviously Christ and Christ is King, you know, the King and God the Father, whereas the Romans, uh, you know, whatever deity that they were worshiping at the time, that's who the Dapnon was dedicated to and, and so on and so forth. And so these meals were seen as a form of worship, which is one of the reasons that in... Um, I forget where it is. Anyway, it's a non-canonical book. Uh, it talks about, uh, I, I don't want to say the book because I'm, I'm going to get it wrong. Anyway, it talks about the uh, fact that uh, you know, the Jews aren't allowed to even sit down at the same table with Gentiles. Why? Because if you sit down at the table with a Gentile who is quote unquote unconverted, right? Not converted yet to Christianity or to Judaism or whatever, then they might be worshiping a different God than the God that you're worshiping. And so essentially you are now participating in a pagan ritual is kind of how, how this is going on. Ultimately, I think that we see some of this in Paul's 
speaking in First Corinthians. Rob, do you want to take this over for a few seconds and then yeah, I'll remind come, uh, me what's the specific question? <coughs> let me let me see if I have it on my phone. So he's so Christian just says, I was wondering if you and Rob could help me understand what Paul is teaching in First Corinthians eleven twenty six through thirty four. Let's read it. For as often as you eat. Oh. This bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats and drinks, uh, I'm sorry, eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then uh, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we, ju- if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when he comes, uh, so when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things I will give uh, directions when I come. And yeah, I, I take this I get, as a Passover meal, and I t- but I, I recognize too that it's possible that they used they used the Pesach or the Pascha as a replicatable teaching uh, meal, like a formal. And so the purpose of this was not to satisfy your hunger. Obviously, this was the this had to do right. with teaching about Yeshua. I mean, it's proclaiming his death. I mean, it's a memorial to to the the Pascha meal that Yeshua had with his disciples. And I believe that, I mean, even earlier in the letter, he says, keep, we're going to, we keep the Pascha. And doesn't he also say, and I'm, I'm going to Jerusalem for, I want to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost, right? So there's, in my view, he's encouraging them to, uh, and also, if I remember correctly, he had been, he had spent a year and a half in Corinth, which might mean even two different Passovers that he spent with the Corinthians that he's writing to. Now, does that mean it's only, so this is a thing, well, well, as often as means, oh, it could be every day. That's what the, you know, the mass, right? Or once a week or once a month or, or whatever. I, I don't think Paul would have been against other me- meals throughout the year at certain pacings, but they would be preps for the Passover, in my opinion. And they would be kind of part of, they would be educational. They're helping educate people into the Torah, into keeping Passover, ultimately. That's that's my opinion. Um, and, you know, in the Torah itself, I think it's Numbers chapter 9, and it's like it says, the Lord tells Moses, okay, it's the second year, right? They're, they're, they've, they've been out of Egypt for a year. It's now the first month. You guys keep, keep the Passover. And then there were some guys that like, well, we were unclean because of dead body, we can't keep the Passover. So then Moses says, wait here, you know, I'll find out from God. Moses learns, he says, okay, you, the second month, you can keep the Passover according to its ordinances. Right. You, you, they still have to eat unleavened bread for seven days, even, even though it's the second month. So the idea of like, well, okay, what it, What's going on here? Why why are they allowed? Why did God say they're allowed? Because if they're on a journey or if they're um, uh, unclean, that there's like, look, you okay, you were una- you were disqualified for the main one, right? The real one, which is in the first month, but you there you retain some sort of obligation to mark it, but so could it be that every full moon of the month, you know, Paul or taught them to say, like, you can have like a mini Passover. I don't know. I, I, we, we just don't have all the information, but I think that we, we don't want to ignore the time cues. The fact that Pascha is mentioned in the letter, Pentecost is mentioned in the letter. And we know from Max that he was lived next to the synagogue for 18 months. I mean, this is all, important stuff. So, uh, lots, lots going on here. Um, 
so I call First Corinthians Paul's Passover letter because uh, he he uses this theme throughout, right? And because exactly of what you're talking about, the time markers that he gives. By the way, in preparation for Passover, uh, which is coming up in two weeks from the time that this show is being aired, um, I have released a uh, a article on Pronomian.com. Uh, I just released it yesterday, and I'm going to send out an email to my subscribers uh, alerting them of this. But um, I have just released an article on meal traditions and the Passover Seder. And so go and check it out um, if you want to. Uh, it's It was asked for, so I released it. Um, let's talk specifically about this First Corinthians passage. There is a lot going on here. I think that Rob's on the right trail. And I will, once again, I'll, I'll just preface this, you know, in a, in a year or two, my view on this may have changed. And the reason why is because I am still very much working through this. And every time I come to First Corinthians, I'm looking at other commentaries and other books and trying to, to just kind of understand exactly what's happening. <clears throat> I think that, that uh, Rob's on the right track with the idea that Paul is using Passover as the pinnacle. He's using it as like the model banquet, right? Passover is the model banquet every single year that we look to. So if you're going to have a different banquet, okay, that's totally fine, obviously, right? We have other banquets all the time. But ultimately, we look to uh, the Passover as kind of the model of what's going, of like how we should act, how we should uh, treat each other, all these kinds of things. Because it encodes, it encodes Yeshua's message. Exactly. It, it encodes the, gospel. the whole covenantal, yeah. Right. And so I think that, that that's might what be, we need to be repeating. That's what we need to be learning. Absolutely. Of course, obviously, can we have a, another Passover besides just the Passover? No, of course not. This isn't replacing the Passover or anything like that. We also need to remember that, and I've argued this uh, other places, but um, that I be- I'm 100% convinced, and, and I think that this is pretty well attested to, bread was a, uh, was a representation of all the meal. So in the beginning, and this is still true today, right? A lot of the time we'll, we'll pray and we'll break bread, right? If you're in a Jewish synagogue setting, <clears throat> what do they do? They, they say the prayer over the hamotzi, right? They, they say the prayer over the bread. And what does this do? It represents the entire meal. It doesn't just right. re- represent that one piece right. of bread. Okay. So the bread in the first century was the staple of the meal. And so you, bl- bless, you blessed and broke the bread. And this was to represent the entire meal. And the wine portion of it was a representation of the ceremony a- ceremonial aspects of the day- non, of the banquet. And so when you have the breaking of bread and the blessing of wine, what you have <clears throat> is an enca- encapsulation of the entire banquet meal itself. So it's like bookends, right? We have the, the, the blessing over the bread and wine at the beginning, and then he blesses the wine again at the end of the of the Passover meal. So this, I, I don't think that he's trying to give you new elements for like the like communion or something like that. Okay. With all of that said, he's talking in this passage. If we start back in ten, he's talking about about the idea of sharing a table with demons. Right? You can't you cannot come to the table of demons and also participate in the table of the Lord. So this is the setting in which he's actually talking. He's not talking necessarily about Passover itself. He's talking about coming together and eating a meal together. In 1 Corinthians 10, 1, he says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized, excuse me, and baptized uh, into Moses and in, uh, in the cloud and in the sea. So once again, we're taking this idea that they've come through, they've gone through the Passover, they have, they're a community now, right? They are a community. And they're kind of the model community that Israel has always looked to. Um, And all ate the same spiritual food. Once again, he's talking about the the point of Passover, which is the gospel message. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things took place as an example for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell, so on and so forth. So he's talking about this idea of the Israelites come out of Egypt, they go through the Passover, and then what happens? They're idolaters. They are still worshiping the God of the, the false gods in their heart, but they're trying to worship God, the true God. And remember that this letter starts, he's telling these people, 
you're, you have men that are doing horrific sexual immoralities in your community. Okay. So what are they doing? They're holding on to their paganism. They're holding on to their pagan ways. They're holding on to something that is not of God. And so all of this is wrapped up in this idea of coming together. And now let's just jump over and we could, I mean, I could talk about this for hours, so I don't want to bore everyone. But now we get over here to, let's go to 23. For I received from the Lord what also deliver, what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Yeshua on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this is the cup. Uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So ceremonial meals. I don't think, I know this sounds weird, but I actually don't think he's talking about Passover meals. I think he's talking about any banquet meal that you have. He's just using Yeshua's words as the, as the, uh, like the, the, the model. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So now let's think about that in terms of the entire entire message that he's saying. If you're proclaiming Christ's death, yet you're sitting in the community and you're just coming because you're hungry. You're not coming to worship the Lord. You're just coming to have a meal. Or you're sleeping with your you know, your father's wife or whatever. Right, you've got some doctrine of demons that you're... Yeah, right, exactly. To, you're you're trying to worship two gods at once. In your actions, you're worshiping one God, well, which is not the true God. it's a disgrace to Yeshua. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Exactly. It's because you're not even worshiping Yeshua. You're... Yeah, and so hence, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And what I take this to mean is if you come into the community and you say that you're a believer and you sit down and you proclaim, yes, Yeshua is, is Lord and, and he's my Lord and all these things, and then you go out and you're worshiping false gods and you're living a life unto these false gods instead of what you're proclaiming in, in the congregation, you're coming to the altar of God and you're, you're not being honest. And you're you're bringing judgment down upon yourself. That's how I see this passage. That's not that's not this uh, spirit and truth. It's not worshiping in spirit and truth. Exactly. And so, um, you know, a lot of people, obviously, the the doctrine of uh, you have to be baptized and you have to you know to, to to take the Lord's supper. I reject this outright. I think that I think that it's. I mean, I think that the the idea of bread and wine as the Lord's supper, I think, is a man made tradition. And I did a post uh, for my subscribers on Pronomian uh, two weeks ago about our, you know, I've I've often said let's take communion in solidarity, and I'm I'm wondering if my my position on that is even changing because, oh how conveniently you set aside the commandments of God, for the traditions of men, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, setting aside Passover and saying well it's been done away with and now we do this little ritual that we created. I mean, they're not going to say mainstream Christianity is not going to say that they have created uh, the the communion. But ultimately, look at the progression. This is this is a man made tradition, I think, and I think that this is probably one of the hardest pills for mainstream Christianity that will ever be swallowed. Because you know, so many. I mean, the teaching that the communion brings. You know, it's it's a means of grace and like all these things. People really think they have really bought into this idea that there is something supernatural and spiritually, you know, mystical about this, even if you don't believe in transubstantiation, right? Um, so I think that, it, I think it's a major, I think it's a major pitfall for the Christian church, but it's one that I think that they will get over sooner or later because they have to. Um, I just want to, uh, I, I'm going to read this because I don't want to just sit here and have you see me read. I've always understood the passage as any time believers break bread with each other, do it in, in memory and with deliberate awareness of Messiah and his message, teaching everything about his, uh, him really. Um, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with that. I think that anytime we come together as, as believers, it should, we should see it as a form of worship, right? However, obviously what there's here, are the, here are the obvious questions that come from this. And I think that, you know, I'll let you talk about this too, Rob. What do you what 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 happens if you have a, uh, some kind of a service and someone who's not a believer comes? Are they not allowed to sit down at, you know and have have a meal with you? Now, I personally would say no. They're allowed to sit down and have a meal with you because um, they haven't understood yet. They haven't given their life to Christ. They're not they're not uh, attempting to make this a form of worship, right? They are uh, maybe they're inquisitive, um, but this is also one of the reasons that you know. Well, we could get into the whole idea of is church for non-believers or is it to build up believers so that believers can go out and evangelize and bring, 
you know, bring believers back in. Um, what are your thoughts, Rob? Yeah, well, usually, in my view, these daemons are our invitation. Like, people know what they're going to, and they're given expectations. It's not like, oh, we're having a barbecue at, down the street. <laughs> Everybody's yeah. welcome. Right. It's not like that. It, it, that's like, oh, yeah, I'm hungry. I'll go down, you know, whatever. This is a, a meaningful uh, ritual meal that has encoded meaning, you know, message at every point. And, and I think that if someone is coming, they, uh, like it's not like someone's going to knock on the door. Hey, I heard there was a meal here. I'm really hungry. You know, it's it's a special meal, and so I think that people, not that an invited person can't come, uh, who's just learning, but I think there's some sort of uh, expectation. And if as, if there's a person who's like, I really want to come and experience this, and and there's no reason to think that they're malicious, then they should be allowed to come. You know. Um, you know, so, that's, something just that's my view. If some, now, if it was a, an official Passover in Jerusalem with the lamb slaughtered, you know, their males have to be circumcised. You know, this is like this is uh, so. Even the a Passover celebrated in the exile in the diaspora is not the same as a Passover. Yeah, man, lamb you and I are slaughtered. You know. According you to and I are, are on the exact same wavelength right now because it just struck me while you were talking mm -hmm. earlier, mm -hmm. you know, the Passover itself is in Jerusalem and a lamb is present that has been to the temple, has been slaughtered by the temple, has been given back to you, you go and you're roasted. Paul's talking to people in Corinth. There's no, you know, you're talking over 400 nautical miles before you hit Jerusalem. They're not, they're not going, they're not going to Jerusalem, right? And so the point here is this, no matter what they said, whether it was on <clears throat> whether it was on uh, Nissan 14 or whether it was a different day, technically speaking, they're not celebrating the Passover in terms of the way that the Torah has prescribed it, right? Now, they might be celebrating Passover in the exact same way that we today celebrate Passover, right? There's no lamb on the table that has been sacrificed. Even if you have lamb on, this, on the table, it's not, it's not the Passover lamb, right? The, so the, the point here is that he's talking to people who are going to be having a specific special date non. It's not a Passover date non, even though it, they might be celebrating Passover. It's not the actual Passover date non. So, I mean, once again, I think that this bolsters and strengthens the idea that he's talking about any kind of a date non that you might have. And he's using the Passover date non as the, as the pinnacle because he is, you know, where is he going now? He's going to Jerusalem. Um, and he's missed Passover at this point, but he's, he's going to hit Shavuot, which means next time, next year, he will hit, you know, his, I think he's hoping that the next year he will hit Passover. Of course, I think if my timeline is correct, he's in prison at that point. So, um, he's probably not. Here's another way to think about it too, is that there was no ritual meal among the early Christians that did not point to Yeshua and his last Passover with his disciples. So that, because that's the message, that's the gospel message. I mean, it, right. it's all encoded there. They, if they, it's not like they would have a meal and, and the message would be something different. Right. Uh, oh yeah. This right. week we're studying the ancient Greek uh, cult of <laughs> right. Dionysus. Right. Or something, right? It, it's, it's, they're on, they're on message. They know what their message is and they're, uh, every every time you have believers together, they they're re, uh, gathering around that truth. So anyway, yeah, it's a good it's a good it, it's fitting this time of year uh, to be talking about this. Absolutely. All right, we got uh, what? What do we have? We got uh, fifteen minutes left. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. Let's go. Let's go to another one. Let's see what we got. <laughs> This one, okay, so this one's a little bit harder because Jesse, uh, 
Jesse, uh, this will be a good conversation though. Let's do it. Jesse writes and he says, as I was watching this uh, quick video, it, by the way, the video, I will put this in the show notes. This is a video by Mike Winger. I know Mike. I've met him before. Um, he probably doesn't know me, but uh, I've, I met him. I've met him, I think twice at ETS. Um, anyway, um, and I would say that Mike takes, the, the video doesn't matter. No offense to Mike or to Jesse. The video doesn't matter. And the reason the video doesn't matter is because Mike in the video just takes a very standard interpretation of the passage. So Jesse says, I was watching this quick video. I will admit that this parable is maybe a more difficult one to interpret, but I definitely think Mike needs to work on his interpretation. Could you guys potentially go over this in Messiah Matters? Now he's talking about the the uh, the parable of the... Um, Let's see here. It's in Matthew. Where am I at? I clicked out of it. Sorry, Matthew 9, 16. Is that right? Yes, Matthew 9, 16. <clears throat> no one puts a piece of unshrunken cloth on, old, on an old garment for the patch tears away from the garment and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. Now, we got to take the context, remember. Uh, the So then the disciples of John came... So, uh, verse 14, sorry, Matthew 9, 14. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Yeshua said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. And so this first parable, or the, the wedding guests uh, parable, is clearly, talking about, um, is clearly talking about the fact that the uh, disciples aren't fasting because Yeshua is with them, right? And Winger and others all agree with that. But then they, they, the Christian commentators uh, say, well, now he shifts a little bit. Winger actually admits in his video, and this is, I mean, he kind of contradicts himself. I don't think he realized he did this, but he kind of contradicts himself because what he says is, oh, well, you know, the, the fasting, you know, they're talking about fasting and they're talking about set prayers. Well, first of all, fasting is not a command in the Torah. It's prescribed, but it's not a command, right? I mean, we could argue whether or not um, Isaiah, what is it, 56 or 54, I forget is, you know, in the great fast, it talks, it's talking about uh, Yom Kippur, right? So whether or not Yom Kippur is a commanded fast or not, we could argue that. But ultimately, the, the, the simple practice of fasting is not, um, is not uh, prescribed in the Torah. And set prayers are also not prescribed in the Torah, right? They're not commanded. So you're talking about man-made things. And then, so Winger kind of sets himself up to fail just by that comment, because then he moves on to the standard interpretation that what's happening here is that um, the old is talking about the old covenant and the new is talking about the new covenant. And what he's talking about is the change that's going to happen in between the new covenant and the old covenant. Well, how would he get that from fasting and prayer since those aren't commands in the Torah? It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and th this interpretation just falls extremely flat. Now I looked at my, so as I probably would all the time, if there's something in, in one of the gospels, I look to my father's commentaries. You can find my dad's commentaries on the uh, gospel of Matthew. It's a five volume work. Um, it's fantastic. It's, it's really, really good. Um, and he talks about this. Now my dad takes a view that I think Rob is going to uh, disagree with. And the view that my dad takes in this is that he's actually talking about new disciples, disciples that have not been trained by other teachers. <clears throat> and this would actually fit well, obviously into the context, right? So the new wineskins and the new patch of cloth is the disciples who have no training. They're just lay people, right? They're fishermen. They're, they're not, they're not trained up in a synagogue. They don't have a teacher or anything, as opposed to those who have a teacher, like John's disciples and the Pharisees. And I think that this interpretation actually, not only does it fit, but I think it, it, it works well within the context. However, I have not been told of Rob's interpretation of this passage, and I mm. cannot wait. Mm. Let's go, Rob. Let's hear it. Mm. Well, I think there's, there's support for that view in the later rabbinic world of a disciple of a new disciple being like, you know, and then the, the, the rabbi teaches his disciple, fills his disciple with Torah knowledge, which is like wine. Right. And so disciples that have already been discipled, they're already filled with wine. So that's a later 
in the later rabbinic world. And so some see that and go, oh, that's backdrop for what Yeshua was talking about. Um, I, I read it a little differently for this. I, I read it, it, I think it's important, like you point out, that the context is, wow, John's disciples are doing something, the Pharisees are doing something, but Yeshua's disciples are not following. And it's like, what's going on here? But Yeshua said it wasn't, it said it was, that fasting wasn't appropriate. It's just timing. He says, there's a time where they will fast and they will mourn. But, and, and so in my view, and, and you're also correct, I agree that and we know, I think in Luke, maybe a couple other places, and, and also in the early rabbinic texts, we know that there were groups that had fast days during the week. I think in Luke, the Pharisee and the publican, remember they go up to the temple and the Pharisee's like, I fast twice every week, right? Twice, two, day, two different days in the week. Um, and I think later in the Didache, it says, don't, you should also fast twice a week, but just don't fast on the same days that the, the Jews fast, right? So the idea is there's polemic uh, on that front. So you, it's also an important point that these are, they're not talking about Torah, you know, interpretations from Torah. They're talking about local group um, practices to, cake, to create solidarity among the group. But Yeshua is just talking about appropriateness of man-made tradition. Like it, when, he's, when he's talking about the garment, it is desirable for the old garment, but they're not going to, th it's not to throw away. They don't want it to tear worse. The idea of, a, of, a, of the old garment has a tear. It's like, okay, well, we need to fix this tear. We'll do it wisely. Don't, don't, don't address the tear in an old garment so that it's going to make it worse. Don't make the problem worse. Same thing with the wineskin. It's like, it says all the wine will be poured out and the wine skin, the old wineskin is ruined. Okay, so pause. The, the, the idea pause. is we, we don't, no, preservation no, we, we, is a good thing. Relate that to me though. Relate that to me to the, what, to them coming to him and saying, uh, you know, fast and pray. How, like, how is he relating that to the, to the two? They're or fast. The, they, John's disciples and the Pharisees are implementing for themselves, uh, what we call a kind of, you know, man-made ritual, right? It's not without reason, right? They, they have a reason they're fasting, but it is not informed by proper big picture. Okay. It's, it's, it's short-sighted. So, so, uh, okay. So it's short-sighted because if, if John's disciples start following Yeshua and a Pharisee start following Yeshua, their their the horizon of their understanding is going to change, and they're they're going to start following Yeshua, and and that's a good thing, that's a good thing. It's not it, the idea that the old the old garment has a tear. So that's that's the problem. So it's like oh, the well, old garment has a tear. So in this analogy, we, we, the, the Pharisees are the that. old garment. The, the, old, we, the Pharisees are the, are the old garment in this, in this. The old, the fact that the old garment has a tear is the problem of the Jewish situation at the time. Okay, we have, I'm with you. We are Keep waiting going. for a Davidic king. We, we are in a problem. Rome is occupying our land. Our, we're suspicious of our temple leaders. The Herodian dynasty is corrupt. Sure, sure, sure. We're highly fragmented into these different sects. And yet we have, and yet we are heirs to this promise of covenantal blessing for obedience. And we're without a leader. We're without the, the a Davidic king. We're without a, a Torah loving Okay, hang God on a second. ordained so, Davidic king. And that's, okay. the, that's the tear of the garment. That's the tear. Okay. So now you have the new wine what skins do we do? or the new patch. So they're trying to say, we need to up our personal piety. We need to up our religious observance by remembering our core principles and holding. So we're going to invent things like 
We, we wash our hands. Why? Well, because it represents our heart. We are going to fast twice a week. Why? Well, because it helps us curb our appetite for the things of the world, right? These are all things that and the surface, like, okay, I can understand that. It creates group solidarity. We're going to try to just, we're, we're going to try to encourage one another who have are like-minded. So, okay, but okay. hang on just a sec, but, but pause, pause for a second. So if the new wines, oh, let me take this down. If the, if the new wine skins are, or if the, if the new wine skins and the new, and the new patch is the disciples, how would putting that onto the no, the, Pharise- new, the new patch, the new <clears throat> patch is them trying to use traditions of men to resolve the existential crisis. Oh, I see. The new patch. Okay. Yeshua says your guys is uh, fasting twice a week. It's is like the new a patch. new patch. It doesn't. Right. You're, you're it gonna, doesn't work. You're just making it worse. Why? Because you're <laughs> going to get into these sectarian groups, and it's it. just going to tear further apart. Got it. I, I, I I'm with you now. I, I hear that's, what you're, what that's you're saying. That's my view. Okay. That's, okay. So it's like so the, the, so the disciples Yeshua's are not denying yeah. there's a problem, right? But the, he's the solution. You know, I mean, and and so. It, any view of the Jewish world, any Judaism that did not embrace Yeshua was trying to using patch it up. Works of the law. Yeah, yeah works of the law yeah. are like the new. Boy, new that patch. falls into what Paul says then, eh? Doesn't it? I mean, it, now it, pa- it's now pa- yeah. It's like they're like, well, look, it's good. If we fast, that's a good thing. I like if we it. fasting and praying, that's good. If we, um, you know, we, we just, we want to make our meals kind of like a temple meal, like a, we want to bring some holiness into our home and we want to wash our hands and have, you know, okay. So none of these things is evil, but Yeshua's like, it's short-sighted. It's like what you're doing is you're, it's, a, it's like putting a new patch and you're thinking that this is going to resolve the deeper existential crisis. And the fact I is got you. there is no solution for this crisis other than Yeshua. And Yeshua, right. Okay. So, that, so that's my take. Yeah. Interesting. Actually, I think that that plays really well with Paul then, right? Because Paul runs with that, especially in the Acts 15, right? Because they come down and say, unless you are circumcised and so on and so forth. They, they have a new solution, but it's like, it's like, oh, but it's, wait, it's unshrunk cloth. What that means is it's a, it's well intended. But you're going to rip even more. I it's got like, it. Caleb, like your, your favorite guitar and and the kid down the street is like just learning to yeah, <laughs> or your bit favorite cello. You know, think about the musicians <laughs> um, who need they need an expert luthier, right? You take it to a guy who's like, oh yeah, I'm, I'll fix your guitar. Well, he's got he good intentions, but he doesn't have the tools. He doesn't oh have my the word! I, and all of a sudden, I got a it's story like, Sorry, about dude. that. You know, you I, what? I used a glue that. You know, I got a funny. story. There's pictures online you can find of the guys doing the Dead Sea Scrolls, like in the 50s. They got like a cigarette with like an inch of ash hanging off their lip. And, <laughs> and they're like scotch using tape. scotch tape. Yeah. <laughs> scotch tape to like, and there's just like a table and all these fragments. It's like the people today, like manuscript preservers today are just like tearing out their hair. They're like, ah. So, I, okay. I, I, I as many of you know, I've, I've played the cello and I have for 35 plus years. And the end, uh, I, I was doing a, I was going to do a, I was playing in a, with a guitar player and, and, and singer. We were commissioned to do a, a, a wedding up in, I don't know, it was three hours away. And my dad had bought me this, uh, I had a new bow and the, and the bow for my cello was, was beautiful. It wasn't new at the time. I mean, I was a couple years old, but my dad had spent, I don't know, 900 bucks on this bow, something like that, right? And that was low end for what we were, you know, for for the caliber I was playing at, but they, that's fine. And so, but for me, it was like, man, this thing's amazing. I finally got a decent bow. So we go, we play the the ceremony, and now we're slated in the middle of the woods, by the way, we're slated to now play the reception. And I stupidly put my bow against my chair here, as I did every single time. And I start to put my pack my cello up so we can walk to the reception. The guitar player doesn't realize it, steps backwards, sp- snaps the bow in half, right? Just steps right on the bow. It's the only one I had. What are you going to do, right? And so... The guy who we were, that like the the guy whose house this property it was his property. He had this giant wood, 
uh, shop on his property. He said, give me the bow. Let's, let's see if we can fix this thing up. So he puts wood glue on it and he wraps the thing right and he gives it back to me. It's got some tension in it. And I'm thinking, all right, I got about a quarter of the way into the first song during the reception and the bow is just falling apart. My dad, who has done some luthier work, wrote a whole poem about how somebody who doesn't know their craft should never touch something that he doesn't know. Do you still have that? Oh, yeah. And, and Dude, I mean, he I wrote, want that poem. He ruined, he ruined the bow by what he was yeah, trying to yeah. do. Yeah, I mean, and he had good, every good intention. Every good intention to try to, to, and, you know, it wasn't his fault. He was just trying to get me back up and running for the, you know, I ended up plucking that entire, uh, that entire, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, what can you do? Um, okay. And thus, the walking bass line was invented. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's been fun. It's been real. I think that's all the time we have. Uh, you know, I want to thank everybody. Hey, Atlas, uh, thank you for joining us and for um, for being a part of the chat room. Uh, thank you, Tora411, for your comments as well. Um, I see them. Sometimes we're not able to respond, but I appreciate you guys and I appreciate the, uh, the interaction. And uh, if you do have some comments that you want to make to us that you'd like us to talk about on the show, if you want topics that... And that's really what happens. One of the ways that steers the, the conversations on the show is people send in the comments. But then when we talk about them, they can uh, they can be part of that conversation in the chat room and and drum up more conversation through the chat room. And that's that's one of the reasons that we try to stay, stay, stay on topic. And for those who haven't been with us for a long time, we know what happens when we uh, go off the rabbit trails into the into the off topic uh, in the in the chat room. The show gets really weird and it gets really weird really quick. And then we're just like sitting there talking to a a chat room that people that aren't in the chat room can't even see. It's it's a whole thing. So that's why we have that policy. But uh, we appreciate 100% uh, you guys coming in and, and, and uh, keeping the conversation going with us. Okay, if you want to send us a video or a topic or anything that you want us to comment on, any conversation that you want us to have, see Hegg at TorahResource.com, C-H-E-G-G at TorahResource.com. That is the email address. Let me move this out of the way real quick. And then also... 253-465-3205. It's 253-465-3205. You won't talk to us. You'll just talk to an answering machine. You can tell us how much you love us, hate us, disagree with us, agree with us, whatever you want to. That's totally fine. And finally, last but not least, please do not for, forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. I know it sounds weird, but it really does help us. If you're already subscribed, hit that like button. All right. We hope that this conversation has done at least one thing. That is to glorify our great God and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. Why? Well, you know why. Because Messiah matters. <laughs>